Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord on the day. My goodness, Tuesday evening. Thank the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody out there. As our audience is building, as the saints are checking in, amen. Everybody's excited and ready to go into the things of God, I pray. Man, how can you not be excited? We serve an awesome God. You never know what he's going to do. That's why you got to always be in great expectation, huh? That's why you got to be in great expectation. Man, always be prepared for the unexpected. Nobody knows our God, huh? You don't know him. I don't know him. He said you don't know me, that your ways are not my ways, your thoughts are not my thoughts. Just come to me and allow me to show you who I am, huh? Man, we praise God on today as everybody is checking in and we are excited like always to bring forth the word. It's going to be a blessing to God's people to further establish those that are his and prayerfully to get some of those who have fallen away and have uh, gone back to the ways of Egypt to come back into the kingdom of God and even those who may not know him to begin to trust him and allow him to speak a word unto their hearts and into their situations that they may come into a powerful relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, there are many words out there right now. There are many voices. There are many memes. There are many tactics that people have going on trying to fix the problems of the world, the problems of the heart, the problems of a sinful human nature. And there are no programs that men can create without God, who have not been in the presence of God, that can help, pardon me, that can help a sinful man. Man is sinful. That's why the cross of Jesus Christ was instituted and brought forth, that we may be reconciled and once again made upright and able to stand in the presence of God and become those vessels in which he originally created us to be. But men want to give you all kind of programs about more jobs and they need more resources and they need more, they need more this if they had more this, if they had more that thing to change. Give man all the money in the world. Give him every house he wants. Give him every car. Give him everything he wants. He's still going to be sinful by nature. He's going to be selfish and he's going to be self-destructive simply because you're only satisfying his flesh. And when his flesh is not brought under subjection, then he's going to react in ways that he was not created to react. That's why the Bible says you must be born again. huh? He didn't say you had to go to a church. He said you must be born again. And you'll ultimately wind up going to a church, no doubt about it, because that's part of the process. But the real process is the surrender of the heart, of the mind, of the spirit, and of the soul, and of all thy strength, becoming as a little child, so that Jesus Christ can fully be manifested in you and birthed in you, that you can become this new creature that we were created to be, to do extraordinary things, to do great exploits, Again, not just to work in corporate America, not just to build up your little resume so people can look at you and shout your name and think you have it going on and you really have absolutely nothing going on. Lonely, hurt, confused, abused, just all misguided and misdirected, kind of caught up in the things of the world. That's not it. And we see that just by looking at people in our own circles, in our own existence. On the outside, it looks like they have it going on. But on the inside, they're crying, they're hurting, they're reaching out for that which only a surrendered relationship to Jesus Christ can give you, which is the righteousness, the joy, and the peace that comes in the kingdom of God. We're going to go into a couple of things tonight and uh, let the Holy Spirit have his way like always. So let's pray and uh, we'll keep going. And as people keep joining us, we'll uh, keep celebrating the fact that God is moving on hearts and uh, connecting people to come home from a long day's work or stop doing whatever they're doing to come join us in fellowship, knowing that nothing but the word of God can straighten your life out and fix your situation. Nothing but nothing else, nothing else, nothing else, only the word of God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day, Lord Jesus. We thank you for another opportunity to 
unfold your word to your sheep, O Heavenly Father. And we ask that you come down in the midst of us, O Heavenly Father, and sup with us and begin to open up minds, begin to arrest spirits, begin to give hope where there's hopelessness, begin to shine light where there's darkness, O Heavenly Father. Let your people know that you have visited them once again, that you have not forgotten them, and that the way has never changed. Give them the courage to just consider that some of what's coming forth, O Heavenly Father, is of you, O Heavenly Father, and is line upon line, precept upon precept, in your word. Draw them to your word, not to me, not to the broadcast, to your word, that they may encounter you for themselves, O Heavenly Father, and begin to get set on the narrow path which will allow them to break free, be set free, and enjoy the life in which you created them to have, not living beneath the precious promises and the, 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 the precious place that the blood of Jesus has purchased for all of us. We thank you right now in Jesus' name that you're a God of purpose. So something is going to happen today. I ask that you get their expectation level up. So give them the courage to go out a little further into the deep. In your son Jesus' name, amen. Amen, everybody. So one of the things I thought I'd start out today with, you know, uh, we're, we're going to get to the word like always, but I was thinking, you know, I, I did watch a little bit of the debate the other night uh, after we got off the broadcast. I watched a little bit. I mean, I couldn't help myself. It was so hilarious that I had to go in and get a couple of laughs in. And it was funny, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time with that because that is a waste of time, even addressing anything that's going on over there. It's really a waste of time. But what I, what I will tell you is this. Whomever is elected does not affect the fact of who the king of kings is. You see, we're going to get a new president, whether it's going to be a male or a female, but that's not going to affect who the king of kings is. And if you know who the king is, that's all that matters. If you surrender to the king, that's all that matters. And that's what we're going to focus on tonight is learning how to get into the kingdom. You see, because if Miss Clinton is elected, then you probably will get more of the same old politics that we've gotten for the last... 20 or 30 years because she's been in politics 30 years and she's part of the establishment. So there will be no surprises there. But if the other gentleman gets in, Mr. Trump, then who knows what's going to happen? You know, it, it, it's all out chaos. We, we, we don't know. But what we do know, again, if we're in our respective places, if we're where we're supposed to be in Christ Jesus, just like we survived Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan and George Bush the first and the second and Bill Clinton and every other president that we've had in our lifetime will survive these two as well simply because we're rooted and planted in Christ Jesus. It matter not who he allows to reign in partial authority in the land. It simply matters that we acknowledge who's in complete authority in the land. And then when we get in that place, you understand, then we'll have the love and the joy and the peace that the Holy Ghost promises. We'll have the peace that surpasses all understanding. We'll be able to keep our minds stayed upon Jesus, knowing that all is well, no matter what's going on outside of us. Because see, that's why Jesus Christ came and died. You know, when I look at um, you look at the kingdoms. Let's look at a, let's look a little bit at the kingdom of the world. We talked about it several other times in previous broadcasts, and I'm just going to kind of touch on it and lead us into our lesson for the day. Is there have been many other kingdoms that have come since the very beginning of the world. Started out with you know the the, the, the Egyptian kingdom, the Assyrians, the, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. I mean, there, there are many other kingdoms, and all these kingdoms were built on the buy and sell system. They were built on. Uh, the leadership of men, they were built on uh, many gods, many other foundations that allowed you to pretty much freely worship and not be centered. You pretty much had to deal with whatever was going on at that time. And we know that each and every one of those kingdoms have collapsed and gone on and, and, and faded away. And now we live in a day and age where we live in the modern era of the United States of America, which happens to be one of the greatest kingdoms to ever exist when you look at its wealth it, 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 it's technological advances, it's reached throughout the entire world, it's influence over the entire world. The fact that it was a nation built on the principles of God, the foundations of God, uh, brought over by our forefathers who came in from other nations. If you look at all that, and it's no surprise that we are where we are and, and the things that are happening, but let's look at what happens within this nation. Within this nation, once upon a time, Plato, and you guys remember Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates, great philosophers back from another era, he did he did a uh, a study called optimal rotation of earning optimal rotation of earning and and what I'm saying by this is listen to this for one second 
optimum rotation of earning. And what that basically said was he did a study on the degree of difference in salary from the very top of an organization down to its very lowest employee, down to the very bottom. And the study goes back thousands of years. But he, he, he started it by actually referencing men or somebody else referenced men of modern times, which goes back not that far, maybe 100, 150 years, in uh, a trio of men that were very, very powerful. And they actually ran the United States, which is why many of our laws have been changed to stop such uh, conglomerations from coming together and corporations from coming together, uh, uh, wiping people out and, and, and amassing great fortunes. And those three men were uh, J.P. Morgan, John D. Rockefeller, and uh, uh, Andrew Carnegie. And what they did was they did this study to show that uh, in 1923 that this optimal rotation of earning from the top to the bottom was 20 to 1, that the men at the very top made 20 times more than its lowest employee, okay, in the natural system. Then when you go down uh, today, I think that number is somewhere around, from the research I did, very limited, it's somewhere around 1,000 to 1. 1,000 to 1 is the profit. So we got to understand that when men are handling such great wealth and great influence and opportunities to shine the way they shine, they're not going to let you go. They're not going to give you a piece of it. They are not going to unless God forces them to do it. You see, you can protest, but even when you protest, many of the people you're protesting to are part of the system. They're part of the mainstream, part of the machine. So that's why Jesus Christ came to get you out of the machine because many of the problems of the world have been created by those at the top knowing that those at the bottom cannot uh, uh, solve them, but they will make those in the middle pay for it. Hmm? That's why the middle class, they're always trying to increase the middle class and make sure the middle class can have a little bit more because the middle class uh, uh, burdens most of the burdens of the nation and people are happy to be in the middle class just to be like the Jeffersons, moving on up and understanding that we were created for so much more and the blood of Jesus has given us access to so much more that we've allowed men and the traditions of men to blind us and captivate us and get us in a system of church and a system of religion where we go, we celebrate, we praise, we worship, but we never surrender ourselves. We never die. We never pay the cost in order to get into this other kingdom that allows us to rise to the top and God to be glorified through us and his love and his grace and his mercy and his unmatched power can be expressed through us and then we can attract everything we need to be the people he created us to be outside the system. You see, we got to get this because there are millions of people who are never going to be part of the system. They're never going to get off the bottom unless someone goes and shows them and preach this gospel of the kingdom. But you got to first get it for yourself. And then our young black men that are hurting, looking for meaning, looking for a place to express their creativity, their power, their royalty, their kingship. It can't be done in a world that is threatened by them, in a system that is threatened by their uh, uh, their diversity, uh, their confidence, their power. But you see, we have to reconnect them to their creator to show them why he gave them such gifts and why people are threatened by them so much. It can't happen working in the, in the man's system. And I'm not saying the man in terms of racial overtones. I'm saying the man's in terms of flesh and blood. God has become our wisdom. And if God, Jesus Christ has become our wisdom through God. And if God created the world and he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us and has become our wisdom, then why don't we get connected to wisdom to have the wisdom to overcome a system that's not based on wisdom? Huh? It's not based on wisdom at all. It's based on injustice. It's based on greed. It's based on deceit. It's based on many other things. So what God did, he's looked down. He saw all those other kingdoms from all those other generations. And after he led the king, the children of Israel out of, 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 of Egypt and with that exodus, he knew that many generations on down the line that there would be a need to send Jesus Christ into the system to help us be totally free and have the invitation to receive real salvation. Real salvation has nothing to do with solely dying and going to heaven at a later date. Real salvation is about safety. Safety, security, and certainty 
in Christ, he who has been given all power and authority over heaven and earth, now that I'm in him, I'm connected to him. I'm opening up my mind and, and, and my heart and my soul for him to come in and, and regenerate me and to dwell in me, to give me the keys of the kingdom to operate in this time, in this era of deceit, of crookedness, of darkness, knowing that I'm going to win at all times because he said it in the word, huh? If we abide in him, but we miss that word abide. When you abide somewhere, you live there. If you dwell in him, that means you live there. You're a tree that's planted. You don't keep moving. You're not, you're not tossed to and fro by the economy, by new ideologies, uh, by people coming up with new programs and plans. You simply keep your eyes on the word that has survived and thrived over every kingdom, every plan, every system that every man or one man or demon has tried to interact unto God's creation since the beginning of time. He always wins and he's going to win. That's why he never fears and he sits back and he looks, but his heart is saddened because so many of us still refuse to come out of this system. We just think it's going to be different for us. We just think that we're going to be the ones to change it, not understanding the system is going to be changed by those who've been supernaturally infused with the Holy Ghost, with the wisdom of God, the power and authority of God, and the, and the courage of God to go in and speak things that have not been spoken, willing to be ridiculed, re willing to be rejected, willing to be ostracized, and whatever else goes with it, because this is what happened to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Huh? He says in Hebrews 12 and 3, it says, For consider him that received huh, such contradiction of sinners, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. He's saying the same thing to those of you who will go into the kingdom of God and the indepthness of his word and get an understanding and quit trying to understand and just surrender because you're never going to understand because it'll never match up to your rationale or your natural mind. Remember, we have been pre-programmed from kindergarten all the way through college to believe only what we can see and receive only that which we can make happen. But the kingdom of God is about rest. It's not about what you can do or what you can help him do. It's only about you believing and, and surrendering and entering into the rest and allowing what God has for you to come upon your life and he can be glorified because you believe what he's already done through his son, Jesus Christ. See, the world does not want you to get that. That's the simplicity of the gospel. That's why he says in Matthew 19 and 14, when he tells his disciples and the children want to get to him, he said, suffer, suffer the little children to come unto me uh, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Huh? We have to become like little children. And then as adults, we try and complicate that knowing the attributes of children. Children rely on authority, those that are over them. Teachers, police officers, Cub Scouts, parents, whatever. They follow instructions. And all God is saying is get to the place where you're not, a, where you're not smart, huh? Where you don't use the weapons that I already told you won't work in the supernatural. They don't work on this level. I want all that stuff thrown away in the trash, matter of fact, because he says that when you become a new creature, a new creation, that the old things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. Did he not say, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus? Huh? Christ Jesus' mind is not given when you get a degree. Christ Jesus' mind is not given when you get a promotion. Christ, Christ Jesus' mind is given when you stay connected in relationship, in a surrendered position, subservient to Jesus Christ in a low state that he can rise you to a high state but not before he prepares you to operate where he's going to place you. You see, you can get there too fast. And one of the things he wants to do why he has to take us through this process and break us down and realign us and gut us out is because our flesh still wants attention. Our flesh will steal his glory. Our flesh wants to be admonished. All you got to do is look at Facebook all the time. Look at the number of people who are just saying, look at me, look at me, look how beautiful I am. Look at what I'm doing today. Look at what I'm not doing today. Look at me, look at me, look at me. And it's not about looking at you. God doesn't want people to look at you. God wants people to see him through you 
in the type of life you live, in the words that's coming out of your mouth, in your radical surrender, then he wants people to look at you because then all you're going to do because you're dead, you're not going to talk about you. You're going to talk about he whom you serve, he who died for you, he who has made the way out for the masses because there is no way out in the system for everybody. Only some can get out in the system depending on their gifts, depending on how they look, depending on how much they're willing to shrink to not offend anybody, depending on who they know. See, it's a rigged system. But in the kingdom of God, those of you on Facebook that I continue to look at, 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 at you crying out on how crooked the system is, how you work in two and three jobs like a slave and how you never get rest and some of these other things. This is a timely appointed word for you. Huh? He has once again visited his people to give you the opportunity to come out of the system. Huh? And the way you come out of the system is availing yourself to go deeper into the knowledge of God by spending more time with God so that you can grow in the grace and the knowledge of God and get an understanding of his ways and have the courage to come out. Because you'll never come out as long as you're casually just listening to broadcast, as long as you're casually just going about it. This is a radical move. This is a un 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 un, un it, 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 it's, 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 it's a move that has rarely happened in many centuries since the first disciples because it's been watered down. You see, many people are losing interest right now because I'm not talking about what God is going to do for you right now in your current state and where you are. You think your job is the way or going through a career is the way. But see, the Bible doesn't say that. He said, it is the Lord thy God that giveth thee the power to get wealth. Huh? That's in the book of Deuteronomy. In the book of Psalms 75, 6 and 7, he says, for promotion comes not from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. God is the judge. He set it down one and put it up another. When his people are fully surrendered to him and in contact with him and can hear his voice and he's redone their heart, he may put you high in some corporate company to send you back in, but he's never going to send you back in when you're not equipped to stand for him. See, that's what we believe. Oh, I love the Lord. I go to church. God bless me with this job. But then when you get there, you won't say nothing. You're like a church mouse. You shrink up. You won't talk loud. You won't witness to nobody. You won't stand because you're afraid of offending somebody, knowing that if you get in a fence, your boss is going to fire you. And now you don't believe that he will supply all your needs because you skipped steps and you're not rooted and grounded in who he is, not understanding that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, that he's the head honcho and he runs it all. Huh? We have to get to the place where there's a radical uh, dissatisfaction in us. That we're tired and we're tired and we're tired of the way things are and the way they've always been. You got to look at the stuff that you have and understand that it's more than your stuff. I posted earlier on a post on Facebook how sad God must be that his saints always are posting pictures of just their food, their houses, talking about how blessed they are. And they're happy to be fat in the natural with natural and material things. But they're satisfied being lean spiritually. They have no power. They have no authority. They're nothing like Jesus. And they have no desire to become anything really like Jesus. It's just enough to say I believe in Jesus. It's enough to say I follow Jesus. But then when I look at my life, I'm not following Jesus. We talked about it in Psalms 1 last night. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Is that your testimony? Am I judging you? No, the word is. Because either we're going to walk by all of the word or you're not going to live by any of the word. Remember, being 99% his means you are 100% not his. Because that 1% could be one moment that you choose to do something that causes your whole house of cards to fall down. Huh? Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall and Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And all the king's horsemen and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty back together again, huh? Amen. That's what we're saying. We need to get radical. We need to get real. And we need to open ourselves up to the unknown, to the unseen, and most importantly, to the uncomfortable. Because it's going to be uncomfortable. 
Your mind is not going to understand. Your flesh is not going to like it. But guess what he said? He's such a loving God and such a prepared God. He says, cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. I got it. I got it. You just come and allow me to handle it. I, I, I got it. I know what's important to you. Why would I offer you eternal life and salvation and then destroy you or kill you when I could have killed you in your sin? Why would I do that to you and embarrass you when I sent my only begotten son down so that you can have the blessedness of winning now and later? But you got to trust me because what I'm sharing with you now, he says, has been hidden by men. It's been misconstrued. It's been covered over. It's been set into a system to grow a religious system to form denominations, which are cliques which separate and divide people. And then they give you different versions of me, different attributes that I have. And if you don't line up with their attributes, then they say, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. That's not of God. Knowing that I am a God of order. I am not a God of confusion. That is the enemy keeping confusion amongst my people. Knowing the only thing that everybody who serves me have in, uh, in common at all times is the fact that they know that I came and I died and I was buried and I was resurrected and I rose and I hung on that cross, huh? And he's saying anybody who's open to receiving that teaching and living it out and walking it out, which is contrary to everything around you when so many else are saying, no, I'm not doing that. It's easy to do it in the world's way. I understand I can never get to the very, very top, but at least I can get halfway there. At least I can get three fourths there. Well, at least it's better than what I'm doing now. At least I'm better off than some of the other people I grew up with. And he's going, you're still falling short of your kingship. Nobody you know you can compare to what I have set aside for you aside from my son Jesus. Read the book. That's what I've set aside for you. Not anything in the natural. If you try and compare it to anything in the natural, you're selling yourself short. And that's why your heart is at despair as you look around at the great despair, at the great discrepancy, at all the injustice, at, at, at all the horror that's happening right now. As Satan is rearing his ugly head and the people that I've, I've made the, the, the power uh, affordable to, available to, they don't want it. They don't want it. Because they have to give up some of their stuff and they got to be uncomfortable for a little while. And then they got to be tried on their little religion and the little scriptures that they recite, knowing that they have no power and no authority. And they want people to just pat them on the back and agree with them that they're righteous and God has a plan for them. But you won't get in the narrow way. You've built your house on the sand. And when the winds come and the floods come and the waters hit it, he says, great is the fall is going to be your house. Because you have not built your house upon the rock and you're playing with God. And I told you earlier, if you play with God in any area of your life, be certain that the devil is going to be allowed to play with you. And we know he plays games that don't feel good, that don't look good, because they steal, kill, and destroy joy, hope, family, finances, and futures. Amen. Now that we got that out of the way. Let's get into our lesson. And this is going to tie right into our lesson because all we're talking about is kingdom living. We're talking about becoming kingdom citizens. We're saying we are peculiar people, pilgrims traveling through, huh? A royal priesthood, a chosen generation, a holy nation. He's told us we have to come out from among them and not touch the unclean thing. He's given us commandments, ordinances, and statutes. Those are the things that ensure that the enemy cannot destroy me or deter me from my destiny. But if I refuse to operate in the confines that God has set forth, that I'm equipped to do now because of the grace of Jesus Christ, it's his grace that's sufficient that allows me to do it. Huh? I can't do it in, on, on my own, no. But if I'm in Christ Jesus, I can do it. If I will surrender and deny myself, like he says, of some things that I am allowed to do, but I just don't do simply because I want to be pleasing unto my father and I want the fullness of my inheritance so that I can help be a light in a generation that's looking for light, that's walking in darkness, that continues to go through the exact same systems that many of our forefathers have gone through 
knowing that not many people are going to have an opportunity to be a small business owner or build a great corporation in the natural with men being wicked as they are and the economy being volatile and people being as suspect as they are. God is saying none of those factors matter when you come to me because in the kingdom, I control it all. The king controls everything that happens in the kingdom. So the first scripture we're going to look at is Mark 1 and 15. I hope you got your Bible and your sword. Come on, walk with me real quick. Walk with me real quick. We're going to walk through this. We're going to walk it out and we're going to keep it moving. And everybody's going to have a great night. But I guarantee you right now, if you're open and your spirit is hungry, I guarantee you, you're going to be blessed on this night. Because it is a very rich word. It is a very real word. And every word I'm sharing with you, I'm sharing from not only the word, but it is my testimony. It is how I live. And I know that the time is going to come when God shows God plays show and tell. You see, if you really believe God, you will begin to speak those things that are not as though they were before they even happen. Because that's what faith says. In the middle of the test, in the middle of uncertainty, in the middle of when it looks like it's over, you begin to speak to your mountain and it will be thou cast into the sea. You begin to speak and then God goes, he really believes, she's really persuaded. Yes, he said, uh, uh, let the rich, let the poor say I am rich. You see, you got to say these things, but you can't just say them to be saying them without being rooted and grounded in the truth and having a real anchor that keeps you from blowing away when the next storm comes, which makes you change your mind and then you're double-minded. Or when you hear another word that's not as explosive as this word, you think it's not God. No, when you spend time with God, that's why he says, my sheep know my voice and another they will not follow. That's why he says that they can't be plucked out of his hand because they're planted in the word. They're planted in him. You see, it doesn't matter who comes or who does not come. I have to keep going, you see, because we know that some people are only going to believe what they see. See, they can't walk by faith yet, but they shall. huh? They shall in Jesus' name. So Mark 1 and 15 says, and saying, this is Jesus, this is Jesus. He's saying, we'll start at 14 and 15. He's saying, now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee Preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, huh? And saying, the time is filled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. See, God is calling for repentance from all of us right now because we've all sold ourselves short. We've all fallen for the trick of the devil. And there must be repentance. Repentance simply means a confession of the mouth in conjunction with also a change of the mind and the heart to turn around and get on a new path and walk in a completely new way than you walked in before. And it's not something that, you know, the, the modern church has allowed people to get baptized by being sprinkled and not being dipped, to come in and, and, and go through step-by-step -step discipleship classes when that is not the way it happened in the Bible. When he said repent, he mean do it on the spot. Do it on the spot because... Uh, I have something that I need you to do and it has to be done right now. And God wants us to do that right now because unless we get to the point where we're really radically for him and doing everything according to his will, it's not going to turn out the way God wants it to turn out. You understand? My battery. I told you Satan something else. I charged this thing early and now it's blinking. See, the word is so rich tonight. He don't want this word to go out, but the devil is a lie. I got my thing right here. I'm going to charge it up. I'm going to plug it up right now. One second. But ain't one thing, it's another with the enemy. Always fight dirty. Dirty, dirty, and dirtier. Dirty, dirty, and dirty earth is the way the enemy fights. But we're going to keep it moving and we're going to know that God's going to do something because you know what? There's some hungry people out here. There's some hungry souls. There's some people that are ready to win. And we're going to get this word to make sure that you win and win big. If this cut off, you got to know I'm coming back. So don't you despair. If he's trying to do anything that's out of the ordinary and we, we miss our connection, I'm coming right back. Don't worry about it. So Jesus is saying, you got to repent and you got to believe the gospel. You got to know that everything that's in my book is real, it's righteous, and it's for you. 
but you got to operate within the confounds that I've given you in order for it to be made manifest in your life. Because outside of doing it my way, it's going to turn out wrong. It's going to look good. It may even feel good for a season or seasons. But ultimately, because it's built on sand and you didn't start out the right way, I got to tear it down. Because the only way up is down. You understand? There's nothing wrong with starting down. A lot of us come from small beginnings anyway, but because we've gotten of age and we've accomplished some things and we uh, uh, have reputations and we want the, the ammunition of men, we want people patting us on the back and acknowledging us, we're afraid to get back in the place of being humbled by God, not understanding that that is the place of honor. That's the place of glory. That's the place of promotion. huh? That's how the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years got healed. That's how blind Bartimaeus got healed. Huh? The man at the pool of Bethesda. You get it in the low place because that shows your heart is not haughty. You're not puffed up. huh? And he know that if he can trust you to do that, he can trust you with greater things. Did he not say that if you're faithful with a few things, I'll make you ruler over many? Oh, in Jesus' name. Let's go to the next scripture. Let's go to John 10 and 10. John 10 and 10. John 10 and 10. This is simply Jesus once again talking. Huh? Jesus is talking. This thing is not charging, and I don't know what's going on. Is it charging? John 10 and 10 says, The second, well, we'll read the whole verse because Satan is in this verse too, but Jesus is talking. Satan's not in the verse, but he's talking about Satan. And we need to know John 10 and 10 says, The thief come not, the thief come not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Again, we focus, we focus only the second part of that verse, that I am come. This is why I have come, okay? I didn't come for you to just die and go to heaven later. I didn't just come for you to go through life lost, being oppressed, depressed, and dealing with uh, not being equipped to deal with Satan and his imps and his munichs and all his little partners. No, no. I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. But we have to look at that word might because it's conditional. You see, the condition is not again that you join church. The condition is not that you said a sinner's prayer. It is not that. That is easy to accept his, his, his free gift of, of salvation, his invitation. But the challenge comes in in walking that thing out, huh? And getting an understanding of what you receive. So you can receive salvation in a moment in terms of saying the sinner's prayer or walking down in a church and joining a church. But you spend the rest of your life understanding what you have received. It takes a lifetime to get a full understanding of that one moment of that decision you made. But what Satan does is he allows you to go back into the world and you get so distracted and so bombarded with taking care of yourself and building your reputations and building your own empires that you never focus on the treasure that God has given you and that he sent into the world through one Jesus Christ to allow you to win bigger than any way the world could ever allow you to win. You see, that's why he said might, meaning you have to avail yourself and open yourself up to this new way of thinking, new way of living, strange way, way that's going to strip you, ways that's going to challenge you, ways that's going to break you down. But I only break you down to build you back up because I put something in you once you come into my family that you don't know it that I put in you. You see, it's that holy thing. Huh? The Bible says in Acts 5 and 32, he says, and the Holy Ghost has he given unto them that obey him. That's where that might comes in, in this verse. If you obey him, the Holy Ghost is going to do something awesome in you and begin to allow you to be the clay that's put back on the potter's wheel, being reformed and shaped and molded into something glorious. Let's go to John 17 and 3 real quick. John 17 and 3, family. John 17 and 3. We're going to read down one through three. This is Jesus again. Look at what he says. He says, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him 
a, a power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou has given him. And this is, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. This is life eternal, huh? Not a place later, not a post-dated check, not sometime after you transition. That's part of it. But this is life eternal, that you might know God and Jesus Christ, whom he sent. The one who came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The one who's the way, the truth, and the life. The one who has all power over heaven and earth. The one who says you can lose your life and lay it down and come to me and cast all your cares because I'm going to watch over your stuff. huh? As you watch me, let's go to 2 Timothy 1 and 12 real quick. I believe that's it. 2 Timothy. You see, we got to learn to trust God a little bit more and get a little bit more radical and get out of fear because what happens is Satan has kept us in fear for so long that we don't we don't want to um, we don't want to allow God to have his full way with us and allow him to uh, do what he's ordained that he wants to do in our lives huh God wants to do some amazing things in our lives but it takes us picking up our cross and not being fearful huh? For which cause, hold on one second here, making sure I got the right verse. For which cause I suffer, look in here. It is, uh, yeah, 2 Timothy 1 and 12, everybody there? 2 Timothy 1 and 12. 2 Timothy 1 and 12. Look at what's said here, and it reads as thus. It says, uh, 2 Timothy 1 and 12, it says, For which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. All he's saying is, I can be obedient to the command, to the charge, Jesus Christ has commanded of anybody who will come after me. He said, if anyone will believe in me or follow me, they got to deny themselves, pick up their cross and follow him. Paul is saying to Timothy, he's saying that for the which cause I'll suffer these things. Huh? Because I know on whom I believe. I know that he's able to keep that, huh? Which I surrender unto him against that day that he's finished doing whatever it is he needs to do in my life, that once his favor comes upon my life and I get in that favored place, that everything is mine is already earmarked for me. See, when he calls me, God has already set aside everything that's mine and he says, I'm going to perfect it for you. But as you go through the process, the enemy is going to come in trying to blind your mind, making you think you're going to be broke and you're always going to be in the low place and nobody's never going to love you or your life doesn't matter. All kind of other smoke and mirrors and mirages. What he's saying is, it's not true. That's why you got to abide in the word, dwell in the word, and go through the hard places knowing that the hard place leads you to your promised land. Huh? They didn't go from Egypt straight to the promised land. They had to go through the wilderness and a 40-day journey and maybe 10 more days at the foot of Mount Sinai, 50 days, they should have been in the promised land. But a 50-day journey, 40-day journey turned into 40 years because of unbelief, disobedience, fear, huh? Lack of trust in God and his word, lack of trust in his messengers. There are many tricks that Satan uses to get us to miss the place. And many people believe, oh, well, um, God has a call on my life. I know it's going to come to pass. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. It doesn't say that. He says, I come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Huh? That's what he says. Yes, that's what he says, not I say. And there are many people in life who've missed their blessing and missed their calling. You wouldn't be the first because of fear, disobedience, ignorance, or just your love for the world. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. That's why you got to fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith and be sold out 
to what you say you believe and on whom you believe. And then your life will show what it is you're saying that uh, it should show. Let's look at Philippians 3 and 12 real quick. Philippians 3 and 12. This is the apostle Paul in one of his epistles that he's written, Philippians 3 and 12. Back toward the beginning of the book, Philippians 3 and 12. Look at what he says in Philippians 3 and 12, my brothers and sisters out there. He's talking, he says, and we're going to focus on the second part of this verse. He says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Huh? Apprehend. When a suspect is apprehended, he's arrested. He's taken into custody. Huh? He's handcuffed. He's bound. He's placed in isolation. Huh? He loses all of his rights. He may get one phone call, but he's restricted. He's limited. Paul is saying that I'm a follow after if that I may be apprehended, that for which I was also apprehended of Christ. So if you are indeed a believer and you're in the family of Jesus Christ, you too have been apprehended. But have you turned yourself in to be in isolation? Are you planted where he wants you to be? Are you meditating in his word day and night that you may observe to do all that is written therein? And in Joshua 1 and 8, it says basically the same thing we said in John 10 and 10. It says that thou may, he said, and then thou will make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. Huh? If you allow yourself to be apprehended for that which you were apprehended and not chasing after your own thing and doing your own thing. You see, uh, uh, Daryl Coley sings a song that I love. It's one of my most favorite songs in the whole world. He talks about, uh, uh, I got to live the life that I sing about hmm? in my song. huh? When the music stops and everything is going off, I still got to live this life that I sing about. And it's the same thing with you and I. When these broadcasts go off, I still have to live this life. I still have to stay planted and rooted and in the word of God to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling to keep going. Because if you don't eat this word that you're being fed, there are other people in other cities, other countries, other places God is going to send me who are going to eat this because they know it to be the only way out. They don't have a plan B, C, D, E, F, and G like many of you. You have an alternative route and until God allows you to come to the end of yourself, this destruction of picking up this cross has to come at your own hands because he's not going to make you do anything. That's what free will is about. And when you're 100% all in with him and you get tired of yourself and you're tired of the system and the affliction and the corruption and everything else that's happening, then you come unto him and you realize that he's apprehended you and been calling your name the whole time to do something amazing, huh? Something amazing. Let's look at Luke, Luke 19 and 13. Luke 19 and 13, please. Luke 19 and 13. Let's look at this. Uh, this is a command from Jesus uh, given in a parable to his disciples and uh, to those who love him and who will follow after him uh, in that age as well as this age right now. This is Jesus talking, okay? We're in Luke 19 and 13. Look at what he says. We'll start at 12. Okay, and he said, Therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. That's Jesus Christ. He came down to receive a kingdom and he's going to return. Okay? That's it in the parable. 13 says, And he called his ten servants and delivered them 10 pounds and said unto them, occupy till I come. Now see, we're servants. And I, I want you to see this. A servant is nothing more. He says that he that will be greatest amongst you, let him be your servant. And he that will be uh, uh, cheapest amongst you, let him be your minister, right? Yes, that's what the Bible says. He that is greatest amongst you, let him be your servant. So those of us who've given our lives to Jesus Christ, we are his servant. And as servants, we are to be transformed into the likeness and image of our master who is one Jesus Christ, which means we must sit at his feet. We must study his word. We must meditate in his word day and night. We must open ourselves up 
to be able to hear the rhema word of God, which may not be written in the written word of God, the Logos, but it will, it will, it will, it, it, it will, it will not contradict each other. It will, it, it will confirm each other. And because we've heard it in our spirits and it's not written on the book, you'll have the courage to still do it, even though he hasn't told anybody else because you spent so much time with him. You really know his voice and you already know you're peculiar and weird anyway. And you don't worry about people understanding you because you don't even understand understand yourself. You go to him often and go, God, what have you done to me? God, what is this? You see, because you didn't ask for it anymore. You asked to be born African American, Caucasian, Puerto Rican, or Russian. You didn't ask to be born 6'8", 5'8", or 5'3". You didn't ask to be right-handed, left-handed. You didn't ask for any of that. Those are all gifts God is giving you. So when you understand that, you have to always go back to the manufacturer and understand what his purpose is for making you the way he made you, giving you the things he's given you, and what he's calling you to do. So he tells them, he says, occupy till I come. But look how he prepares them to occupy these servants. He gives them 10 pounds. Now, I don't know the equivalent of the 10 pounds right now in this day and age, but I would imagine that's pretty much a large sum of, of, of income to be able to carry them over and for them to be able to provide for their natural needs as they focus primarily on spiritual things. Let me say that again, that he gave them a large amount of income to be able to survive and provide for their natural needs as they focus primarily on spiritual things. And see, that's what we as servants are supposed to do. We've been apprehended like Paul for that which we've been apprehended. Do you know why you've been apprehended? Will you occupy till he comes and be like those servants, huh? Because what happens is, he says, but in verse 14, but his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And that's the day and time we live in right now. Many people will call themselves saints, believers, disciples, followers of Christ, and all kind of other things. But they don't, they don't, they don't operate within the confounds and the structures of what a disciple, a believer, a Christian, or a disciple is required of them. They don't aspire to live holy lives. They don't aspire to be sanctified and set apart. The Iglesia, the church, was a called out group. We were called out, called out, separated unto him for his purpose and his glory, not to increase the world's kingdom of darkness, not to increase our own little reputations. Yeah, people go, well, God gave us gifts. Yes, he did, but those gifts were given to you to glorify him and to build his kingdom, not Satan's kingdom. There's no way God, if he wanted to do that, when he sent Moses into Egypt, he could have just told him, look, Y'all just believe in me, but stay here in Egypt and continue to build Pharaoh's pyramids and his castles and everything else. Just work for Pharaoh, but just tell people about me. That's why, that's why I sent Moses after 430 years. That's why I sent Abraham out away from his father and his land. And that's why I took him through everything I took him through and made him and Sarah wait all them years to have the promised seed of Isaac so that you can stay in the enemy's camp and still worship him and partly worship me. No, 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 no. He pulled them out, all the way out, those that will go. You got to come out. And until you come all the way out, you're never going to have the fullness of what it is God has set aside for you. You can let anybody else tell you anything different, but here's what I know. We can go right back to the book. We're right here in Luke. Let's just go to Luke 9.23 real quick since we're right here. Let's go to Luke 9.23. These are Jesus' words. huh? These are Jesus' words in Luke 9 and 23. Let's look at what he says. Luke 9 and 23. We're starting at 23 and we're going to go to 25. Look what Jesus says, not Anthony. Look what Jesus says. And he said to them all, that's everybody, men, women, children, religious, whoever on the scene. And he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Meaning surrender to the plan that I have for your life. Deny yourself of some of those good things you can do. Yeah, it'd be very easy to go back into the world right now and coach basketball, get a job using my communications degree or anything else that I choose.